Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, and let's once again get right back where we left off, Romans chapter 4. And for those of you joining us on television, I have to constantly remind myself that we have new listeners every week, and it's been a long time since we've kind of explained who we are and what we are. We are not associated with any group, although I certainly have my own church background, but they have nothing to do with the television program. And uh, we're independent. We have no connections with anyone. We're not underwritten. We just totally rely on God's people to supply the funds. But uh, we do not try to twist arms out of one group and into another. We're just here to teach the book. And uh, I'm so thrilled that we can get letters from all different backgrounds that they're learning. And after all, that's the only reason we teach is that we want folk to be able to study and read their Bible and understand it. Uh, had a gentleman again a while back say, you know, Les, he said, for years I would pick up this Bible and I would try to read it. I couldn't understand it and I'd put it on the shelf and then months later I'd get to feel kind of guilty. I hadn't read my Bible. And he said, I'd read it, couldn't get anything out of it, but he said, since I've understood your line of teaching, he said, I can just, just revel in reading my Bible. Well, that's all we want to do. We, we aren't here to try to run anyone else down or to convince someone that they're wrong and we're right. That's not the idea. And I don't expect everyone to agree with everything I teach. That's only human nature. But whatever, we trust that... We can avoid error. We want to stay as true to the word as we possibly can. All right, now I'm going to take you directly into Romans chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul is now going to come back to Abraham. Now, Abraham is one of the Old Testament characters that Paul alludes to probably more than anyone else. And in Galatians, he will even say that we who are children of faith are also then the children of Abraham. And boy, that's thrown a curve at a lot of people. Well, does that mean that when you become a Christian, you become a Jew? Why, heavens no. A Gentile is a Gentile, and uh, our salvation doesn't make a Jew out of us whatsoever. But it's just that Abraham was saved by faith plus nothing. See, Abraham didn't sacrifice, Abraham didn't practice circumcision, Abraham didn't have law, Abraham simply did what God said to do, so he was saved by faith plus nothing. And that's where we are. And so that's the connection, that even as Abraham was saved without benefit of law, sacrifice, circumcision, or any of those things, so we too enter in by faith alone. And so consequently, Paul uses Abraham over and over. Now here we have it in chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, in other words, as a Jew, and of course that question came up during break time. It's a good question. What was Abraham by birth? The Jewish nation wasn't on the scene yet, so what was he? That's right, Pat, he was a Syrian. He had two brothers, you remember, that were up there in Syria, Haran and... Uh, who was the other one? Haran and I just had a little bit ago, but anyhow. Uh, those two brothers were Syrians. But Abraham then, by virtue of his call and by virtue of his covenant promises, becomes the father of the Hebrew nation. But his blood didn't change. He was still genetically a Syrian. So, even though Scripture considers Abraham the father of the Jewish race, and consequently we consider him as the first Jew, genetically, Isaac would be the first son of promise. 
and would be then what we would call the first real Jew by birth. But whatever. Abraham, by his birth, was Syrian. And he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, you remember, and Tim came down into the land of promise. All right, what shall we say then as pertaining to our father, as our father Abraham, pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works... Now, isn't it amazing? Paul isn't leaving that word justification behind yet. He is still dealing with his whole business of justification. And in order to clarify it, he's going to come back and use a character from the Old Testament that just about everybody has at least heard of. And most Bible people will know who he was and what the circumstances. And so he becomes an ideal example of a man who was justified, means the same thing back then as it does today. He was declared as if he had never sinned. He were, if, he, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. And then it goes back to what I said in the last program. My, if Abraham would have been given the ability or the freedom to boast or to glory, boy, he would have had a lot to talk about. Because after all, Abraham became a great man. He, he's known throughout all of history. But he couldn't boast one word before God, see? You know, I'm always reminded of Job. Now, here's another one. This comes in for free. Go all the way back to the book of Job. Sometimes these things, I think, just add a little salt and pepper to a lesson. Didn't intend to do this, but let's come back to Job chapter 38. I think I may have done it once before on the program. Once in a while, I'll do it in my classes. But you see, Job, poor fellow, was in a dilemma, wasn't he? Here he had been living a righteous life. He was the pillar of his community. And yet all of a sudden God permitted Satan to strike him and took away everything that he had. You all know the story of Job. And then his three quote-unquote friends came along and told Job the reason for all his problems was this, that, and everything else. But yet you don't get to the crux of Job's problem, I don't think, until you get to chapter 38. And Job did have one. We don't like to admit that. We like to think that Job was perfect. No, he wasn't. Had he been perfect, I don't think all these things would have befallen him. But God had a tremendous lesson, even for Job. And you see, he could have said the same thing about Abraham. Well, right here in Job 38, verse 1. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who is he referring to? Well, his friends. Oh, with all their high kaflutin philosophical language, it was just gibberish. He said, What are these guys who try to spew out all this stuff without any knowledge? Verse 3. Now, you know, I'm glad I wasn't in Job's shoes. <laughs> That this would have been kind of uncomfortable. And God says to Job, Gird up now thy loins like a man. In other words, what's he saying? Hey, don't be a wimp, you know. Don't sit there and, and quiver. Stand up like a man. I've got some things I want to ask you, Job. I will demand of thee, and I want you to answer me. Verse 4. Oh, boy, now this is what I call lower in the boom. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. You see what God is doing? He is putting Job in the place of not being able to say a word. He didn't know how creation happened. He couldn't tell God how he did it. But God says, tell me if you know. Well, what's implied? He thought he knew a lot. See? All right, read on. Verse 5, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? See? What could Job answer? I, I don't know. I don't know. See? But up until this time, Job thought he was a pretty important person. And of course he had been. All right, now, all this I'm just trying to show the same way with Abraham. Abraham was a man of stature in his day and time, and yet 
when he came before God, could he boast? No. He had nothing going for him. And again, all he could do was be a man of faith. And that's the lesson, I think, that the Scripture is trying to show us. Now come back quickly again to Romans 4. I think I made my point. But now verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? See? Remember what I said in the last program, or maybe the one before? When we come before God someday, He's not going to ask us, were you obedient to your denomination? Did you obey their dogma? No. He's going to confront us with the Word, and nothing but. And so here's where we have to be careful. What saith the Scripture? Not what anyone else says, not what some philosopher says. What does the book say? Now, you know, I like this. Paul used this over and over. Turn with me a minute to Galatians. But this is not a quirk. This happens over and over in, in Scripture. Galatians chapter 4, verse 30. Galatians 4, verse 30. Y'all with me? Galatians 4, verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? See? That's what counts. Nothing else. What does the Scripture say? And that's where we have to prepare ourselves for when we meet Him one day. I'll remember years and years ago. I guess the Lord was already preparing me to teach. But we had a young couple that started attending our church, and that's when we were still up in Iowa. And they were from two totally opposite denominational backgrounds. And uh, naturally, they were having some problems in their home life and everything else because of these divergent views. So they had been attending our services somewhat, and our pastor asked me one day if I would just go out and teach that couple on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Well, I'd never done anything like that before, and I was probably shaking in my boots, but I'll never forget what a tremendous learning experience that was. Because when we sat down at their kitchen table and I began to open the scriptures as best I could, she immediately backed away and she said, Now, wait a minute, Les. She said, We have always been taught we don't go by what any book says. We go by what our church teaches. Whoa! What's this poor old farmer going to do with something like that? I'd never been confronted with that before. I thought everybody went by what the book said. But she was quite adamant. And it took me almost all evening to convince her that whatever church, anyone, uh, any denomination that anyone belonged to, those are men. Those are human beings. But this is the Creator God speaking. So we finally brought her around to it. They both came to know the Lord. But you see, there are so many people, even today, that's the first thing they're going to tell you. Well, I don't care what you say. I go by what my church says. Well, if what their church says lines up with a book, fine. But if it doesn't, hey, they're in trouble. They're going to be in eternal trouble, let's be honest. 